So this morning we are going to be talking about a couple of different topics, uh, including making decisions as Christians and trusting God to do what he's said he will do and resting in God's faithfulness. And at the core of this morning's message is a point that we often make. It's not that Christians in our denominational background, at least, don't know enough. It's that we often don't put into practice what we know. You know, that's a pretty common thing. And this morning's message will help us put into practice what we intellectually know to be true. You know, in some denominational backgrounds, there might be a pretty significant lack in knowing what the Bible says, especially when you have topical sermons. Or, And I don't want to knock topical sermons. They can be amazing. They can be full of scripture and, and totally founded upon God's word. But they can also not be, right? There's some that are basically just stories and jokes. And like we often lament, the tragedy of stories and jokes is that at the end of the message, when you walk out of there, that's all you remember. You know, we can all think back of on the amazing stories that we've heard over the years in church, the amazing jokes that we've heard over the years in church, right? That's, that's what we remember because it displaces that. Our flesh already has the tendency to want to ignore God's word because it brings conviction. And our flesh doesn't like conviction. Our flesh likes to be uh, lauded and congratulated and celebrated in these kinds of things. But, you know, God's word will bring conviction from time to time, and that's not always bad. And we shouldn't try to dilute that or, uh, you know, offset that with stories and jokes or apologize for God's word, right? No, I'm sorry. You know, it's a little offensive, this message. You know, and there's a tendency, and I think every pastor, I know I've done that, I'm like, it's a little rough this morning, guys, but... It's supposed to be a little rough sometimes because the danger, as we always talk about, isn't uh, things being hard in the Christian life. The danger is things easy. You know, it's the, it's the comfortable times that destroy most Christians, assuming we're real Christians, right? Those are the, you know, Israel was crying out to the Lord regularly when things were hard. It was when things were easy that they started to worship other gods and, you know, do all these kinds of things. So... You know, it's not necessarily bad to have a message that convicts us, to have a message that, you know, kind of beats us up a little bit. And that's a beautiful thing about a Bible church background or a Calvary Chapel background and these kinds of backgrounds where we're heavy on God's word. That's a good thing. And in our denomination, it's, you know, the danger is for us knowing a lot, but not putting into practice what we know. And it's not about how much you know, right? We talk about this often. It's about what you do with what you know. God's not uh, impressed by how much you know about his word or any of these kinds of things, spiritual topics. He's impressed about how much you're putting it into practice. Case in point, think of when the Pharisee goes and prays with the tax collector standing next to him, right? Pharisee's full of knowledge, full of wisdom, knows the scriptures inside and out, can probably quote entire passages, has memorized them since his, since his childhood. And he prays, oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this dirt bag next to me. Right, paraphrase. That's basically what he prays, right? And then the tax collector just beats on his chest and says, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And the Bible says that the, the taxpayer went away justified. And the Pharisee didn't. Because God wants us to focus on not the knowledge, but in putting it into practice. Otherwise, it's just pointless. You know, the analogy has been made of the Dead Sea. If there's only uh, input and never it's never flowing out, if it's just always going in but never flowing out, you get this stagnant, disgusting body of water like the Dead Sea. You know, there has to be outflow. It has to be coming into us but then pouring out of us. We have to be broken vessels. That's the analogy, right? Because if it's broken, then it's leaking out through us. And it should be everywhere we go, right? We should be the, the fragrance of Christ, which to the world that's perishing is the fragrance of death. So it's not always going to be easy, right? Some people are like, oh, I hate that guy. Why? I don't know. I just hate him. <laughs> don't feel bad. That's normal. That's part of the deal. But if we're living it out, right, and we're actually being broken in Christ, then we're going to have that difficulty at times. That's normal. We just read about it in Psalm 27 when we were reading our morning psalm, right? David had many enemies, and not all of them because of uh, the Lord. Some of them, he had done dumb things and had made some enemies as a result. 
but we will have enemies if we are Christians. That's a normal part of the deal. Jesus himself said, beware when all men speak well of you. And you want to have a, a lot of enemies? Uh, be a hypocrite. And that's what we are if we're learning, but then not putting it into practice. You know, the world hates that. It's disgusting to the world. Oh, church, I don't want to go there because it's full of hypocrites. We hear it all the time, right? We always joke and say, don't worry, there's room for one more. Because at the end of the day, we all fall short, right? But, you know, we, we have that danger of not putting into practice what we know. And I think this morning's message will help us put into practice, in a practical way, you know, what we intellectually know to be true. Every day we make countless decisions. And in a very literal sense, those decisions that we make, even the small ones that seem inconsequential, they shape the trajectory of our lives. Think about those of you who are married. Think about how you met your spouse. This confluence of unlikely events that resulted in you meeting your spouse and forever changing the trajectory of your life. You know, we as church planting missionaries, we see this a lot because we are traveling around planting churches. And so we get to see people's lives that, you know, that we come into contact with the trajectory of their lives forever changed just from the, the, you know, small influence that we might have in their lives, but changes that trajectory of their lives. You know, people that were on drugs, getting off drugs, getting saved, people that were in an LGBTQ lifestyle coming out of that and getting saved, whatever it may be, right? People that were just comfortable Christians, you know, not really walking with the Lord, but professing him in name only while their heart was far from him, those people coming to Christ and getting saved and the trajectory of their lives forever changing because of these conversations at the grocery store or whatever, you know. It's a pretty crazy thought when you think about it, guys. With my wife and I, for instance, it's unimaginably unlikely that we ever even met. She's from France. I am not. And so, you know, it's almost impossible when you think of how many little things and large things aligned perfectly resulting in us meeting. And I don't have the slightest doubt in my mind that that was the Lord, you know. Why? Well, because God had put it on my heart to begin praying earnestly that he would bring me a woman who loved him more than me. And as as we often talk about, you know, that is the recipe for a good marriage where you love the Lord more than you love your spouse. Because if you love your spouse more than you love the Lord, then when your spouse disappoints you, and they will, then you hightail it on out of there, right? But if you love the Lord more than you love your spouse, when they disappoint you inevitably, then you still stay with them because you love the Lord and the Lord says to do that, right? God hates divorce. And so that's what you see when you have a marriage that really works. It's because the glue that holds them together is Jesus Christ. You know, there's an interesting statistic that 50% of marriages end in divorce even Christian marriages. Here's another statistic they won't tell you. Less than 1% of the marriages of Christians who pray together every day get divorced. Whoa. So on fire Christians, where the husband and wife are praying together every day, they have a less than 1% divorce rate. That's insane. That's incredible, right? But they won't tell you that. You know, but God put that on my heart to start praying that he would bring me a woman who loved him more than me. But the way he did that in terms of orchestrating our meeting involved, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of different things all aligning perfectly. These decisions, minor decisions that in hindsight, you know, paved the way for that, that meeting that seems just so unlikely, right? Everything, timing, everything, perfect. And that's why it's so important, guys, that we're asking God to direct our paths and to have his will done in our lives rather than just our own will. 
Because the tendency, church, is for us to decide what to do and then to pray and ask God to rubber stamp the decision that we've already decided to do. This is not the exception. This is the rule. And I'm not talking about non-Christians. I'm talking about Christians. This is the absolute rule. This is what pretty much everyone does and what most pastors and churches will recommend that you do. We had one guy, he didn't go to our church, his son did, and his advice eventually destroyed his son and his life, his son's life, but his advice was, uh, you know it's what God wants you to do when there's a confluence of opportunity and ability. What? Yeah, that's in first flesh alonians. That's what the world would say, right? Because then we would have had Peter go to the Gentiles. He's rough, rugged fisherman. And we would have had Paul go to the Jews. Eh, God did the exact opposite, huh? God sent the scholar to the pagan Gentiles and the fisherman to the religious ceremonial Jews. Because God doesn't care about your abilities. He cares about your availability. And if you would have gone and done the thing that you're already good at, then who gets the glory? You. You're so amazing. You did it. Hey, shocking. No, but God doesn't like to do that. He likes to stretch us, right? He likes to grow us. So he sends us to do things that are unlikely. I'll probably edit this part out, but I hate college. And so what did he do? He sent me to a college town. This is hilarious, right? This is... I am not big on Catholics. So the first church we ever planted, he sent us to the Catholic stronghold of Buffalo. We're like, ha, 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 right. This is hilarious, right? You know, at college group on Friday night, we were discussing how many professing Christians say, oh, I love Jesus in my heart. While they go on to live their daily lives indistinguishably from the world around them. Right? We see that all the time. You're like, what does this have to do with making decisions, is asking God to rubber stamp our decisions? Well, because think about this, guys. God, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, he says that if we want to know his will for our lives, then we have to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Why does he say that? Because your body shows what you really believe. I love Jesus with my heart as I stand there holding my beer and smoking a joint. Well, your heart, your mouth says this, but guess what? Your life says that's not true, right? And that's why the Bible says it's got to be with our bodies. We can't just say, oh, I love Jesus in my heart. Well, okay, if you want to know God's perfect will for your life, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says you got to present your body as the living sacrifice, not your heart. But that's really precious. But if you really believe something in your heart, it will be borne out in your life, in the way you make decisions, the, how you live with your body, right? And like any relationship, that's what we would expect. We were joking on Friday night with the college group and the young adults. And we asked all the girls, girls, how many of you guys want a husband who only loves you in his heart and not with his body? Yeah, guess what? Not a single hand went up. Nobody wants that. How many of you guys want that? No. Yeah, God doesn't either. And it's the same thing with our decisions. If we say we trust Jesus with our souls, but we don't trust him with our decisions, we probably don't really trust him with our souls, right? We need to have a faith that not just is in our hearts, but also is borne out in the way that we use our bodies, the way we use our time, our treasure, our talent, and the way that we make decisions in our lives. If we just make every decision, then can we really say he's Lord? What does Lord mean? We'll talk about this more later. What does Lord mean? Master. What's that make you? Slave. Yeah. <laughs> boss, I'm going to do this. You're like, I thought I was boss. Why are you telling me instead of asking me? But that's what we do, right? Our lives should reflect this, guys. If we're truly walking with the Lord, decisions should also be one of the things that we're laying on the altar of our lives. Because the tendency is for us to decide what we want to do and then pray and ask God to rubber stamp it. Another thing we often see is people 
you know, reading God's word and then having trouble to actually trust God to do what he's said he will do. Church, if God said in his word that he's going to do something, you better believe he's going to do it. You know, I think of um, King Zedekiah. How many of you guys remember the story of King Zedekiah? Well, the prophets had said two things to him that kind of he thought contradicted. So he just ignored God's word because one of them said, you know, you're going to go to Babylon and you're going to die there and you're going to talk to the king face to face. And another one of the prophets said, you won't see Babylon. So he's like, yeah, you guys contradict. This is all, I don't believe any of it. This is garbage. I don't believe it. And guess what happened? They put out his eyes and took him to Babylon. So he stood in front of the king of Babylon and died in Babylon. But he didn't see Babylon. How literal was God? Extremely literal. He didn't trust what God had said. And if God says he's going to do something, guys, you better believe he's going to do it. Not necessarily the way that you want him to do it. We all wish God would do things the way that we want him to do it. We got it all figured out, right? Lord, how many times do we pray like this? Lord, you know, I've, just, I've, been, I've been looking into this. And Lord, I figured out the best way to do this. So Lord, if you would just do it like this, I think this would be the best way. Thank you, Lord. And God's God and he's laughing at you because he knows what you don't, that it's going to blow up in your face. And sometimes he'll let you do it. We go, okay, right? Good luck. Here we go. And then often we blame God when it doesn't work, right? We're like, that didn't work. And God's like, well, that was your plan, not mine. Okay, don't blame me. But if God tells us he's going to do something, he's going to do it. It might not be the way that we like, and it also might not be the timing that we like. Oftentimes we think we're ready for something, but God knows we're not ready for it yet. We can hear yes. That's, you know, we love to hear yes, right? We can even deal with no, but the hard one is wait, right? When God tells you to wait. How many of you guys like waiting? Yeah, I've never seen a hand for that. Nobody likes waiting, right? But yes, and again, Nikki's like, yes. <laughs> no, we hate waiting, right? Waiting's terrible. Uh, you're like, ah, I'd rather just sit in my car than go stand in line. But that's the reality. Sometimes God's like, no, you need to stand in line for a couple more years because he's working something out in us that we might not see, right? And we think we're ready for this, that, or the other, but God really knows the reality of the situation is we're nowhere near ready. And sometimes, again, he'll do it in our timing and it'll blow up in our faces and then we'll get all frustrated. But God's desire is to do it in the way that he knows that will help you grow the best. Because his concern is not for your comfort, but for your growth, right? Like we always talked about. His desire is your sanctification. And when we trust in God to do what he said he will do, then we can rest in his faithfulness rather than trying to spin our wheels and trying to give God a hand to accomplish the thing that he said that he's going to do. We can rest in his faithfulness. And these three things that we've talked about right here, they're all central themes of this morning's text. The danger of asking God to rubber stamp our decisions, the importance of trusting God to do what his word says that he'll do, and the importance of resting in his faithfulness. And the only way we're going to rest in his faithfulness is if we're trusting him to do what he said he's going to do. Otherwise, we're going to try to make it happen ourselves, right? We're going to try to bring God's will to pass. Guys, does God need your help bringing his will to pass? God's not like, oh man, I, I sure hope he helps us. It ain't going to work otherwise. So that's a pretty impotent God, right? No, God is able to do it. He does not need your help doing that thing that he said that he will do. And so obviously, guys, if we have a pulse and we're Christian, then I think this morning's message will be an important one. So without further ado, let's go ahead and read over the text. We're going to be starting in, uh, in verse 15 of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, starting in uh, verse 15, and we're going to take it all the way to the end of the chapter. So 
In verse 15, we read, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office, or bishopric. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show us which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. It's a passage most of us probably know if we've been Christians for a while. We've probably made our way through at least Acts chapter 1, you would think, right? And, you know, we just read a pretty pretty good, what, a dozen verses or so, right? And obviously quite a bit was covered here in these dozen verses. And, you know, a major decision was even made in these verses, right? But there's something missing from verses 15 through 23. You can read all that entire passage, these nine, eight, nine verses, whatever it is, And there's something missing from those verses where all these important things are happening, decisions are being made, right? All this stuff's going on. There's no prayer, right? They get all the way through this. They've pretty much made up their minds, decided what to do, right? And not once do we see the disciples praying. That's kind of weird. You know, we see them making a rational case that the thing that they're proposing not only makes sense, but is even biblical, and they're right. But church, this is a perfect example of how not to make decisions as Christians. Because we can always convince ourselves, and usually those around us, right, that the decision that we're deciding to do makes sense, and that it's even, you know, biblical or spiritual, right? We're able to convince ourselves of that fairly easy. We're able to convince other people, usually fairly easy as well. But a few weeks back, we talked about the deception of the Gibeonites. Right? Remember that? And how Israel was deceived into making an alliance with the Gibeonites, even though God told them not to make alliances with any of the tribes around them. And what do we see in that situation? They did the same kind of thing, right? They investigated And they did what made sense. But the Bible says they did not ask counsel of the Lord. And how did that churn out for them as a result? Not good, right? They immediately had to go defend the people that they had made an alliance with, which cost them a bunch of men. A bunch of people died. Tragic, right? Because they didn't ask counsel of the Lord. They just did what made sense. Same thing we see going on right here. As Christians, we must always make sure that our decisions are bathed and birthed in prayer. Not just what makes sense. Because we can convince ourselves of all sorts of stupid things. And I think most of us know that. We've done it, right? Been there, done that, got the scars. There's no t-shirt, just some scars. It's no fun. So we need to make sure that all the decisions that we're making are founded and covered in prayer. Or not. And we can just do whatever makes sense. 
or whatever that we already want to do. And frankly, that's what most Christians do. That's what most churches will even tell you to do. And then we can just try to blame God when it blows up in our faces. And God will be like, I didn't tell you to do that. That was your plan, not mine. And yet how often, you know, as pastors, Pastor Steve and I see people come and blame God for the mess that they've made of their lives, doing the exact thing that he tells them not to do in their word, in his word, right? And they're just trying to blame God for it. And we're like, whoa, 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 hold on there. You did this. This is not God. You did what you wanted to do and you ignored God. And now your life is a mess and you want to blame God. I've seen that so many times. And this is important, church. Think about this situation. Were the disciples wrong? Was it wrong to believe that those verses needed to be fulfilled and that another person needed to fill Judas's place among the apostles? No. No, they weren't wrong. But they were wrong to think that God needed their help to bring about what he already said in his word that he was going to do. That's where they made the mistake. God's timing is perfect. We know that, you know, we should believe that. We see with the apostle Paul that Christ himself would one day pick that apostle. Just as Jesus picked all the other apostles. Jesus specifically says several times, and those with the confused soteriology think that this is talking about Jesus picking all Christians, when in reality, he's just talking about the disciples. He says, I chose you guys. Again and again, he says this to the disciples. I chose you guys. He chose all the disciples, right? He chose his core group. Why would it be any different with the one that's replacing Judas? If that's the case, who did Jesus pick on the road to Damascus? Paul the Apostle, right? Makes much more sense, doesn't it? Jesus picked all the original apostles. Why would this be any different? All right, now, guys, I'm going to have you pick this one. And then we read a lot about Matthias, the rest of the Bible, huh? Never see him again. They're like, it made sense at the time. You know, I don't want to go too hard on him. We're going to get up there and they're going to be like, yeah, well, just let's talk about your life, Jason. Like, nope. You win. Matthias is probably a thousand times more godly man than me. So not even going to play that. Matthias is amazing. But he wasn't Paul, right? Talks about the names of the 12 apostles are on the gates or with the pearls. I can't remember. In the book of Revelation, right? Do you think it's going to be Matthias, Judas, or Paul? I'm going to go with Paul. As one born out of due time is the way the Bible describes it, right? talking about Paul it says he was he he himself says it he's like I was an apostle born out of due time and that's exactly what we see with Paul right God picked him to be that apostle that would replace Judas but they did their own thing and therefore they as a result they missed God's working instead of just trusting him to accomplish it think about it guys when we think of the term apostle as a name we think of huh, the apostle, the apostle, huh, Paul, the apostle, right? The apostle Paul. That's what we think. He's the only one that has it actually in his name. So it makes sense, right? God's timing is always perfect. Case in point, Abraham was 75 years old when God's like, hey, I'm going to give you a son. He's like, sweet, Awesome. A decade passes, they're getting older, Sarah's went through menopause for sure. She says it, right? She basically says it, if you read the text. And so she's like, it's been uh, 10 years, Abe. I've uh, got my teenage handmaiden here, Hagar. You should probably just have a child with her. Best part of the Bible that's not in the Bible? Abraham goes, Okay. As Ishmael. How did that work out for the Jews? Who are the descendants of Ishmael? The Arabs. Muhammad himself. Claimed to be a direct descendant of Ishmael. Whoa. 
Oops. Crazy, huh? Don't worry, God. We'll help you. You need some help with this. It's very difficult, you know, for you to accomplish your will being God and all. You can throw the stars in the sky, but I don't know. This is pretty tough. But that's you. That's me, right? That's what we do all the time. We're like, God, I'm going to help you. You need some help here. You need help. God needs help Godding. It's, it's tricky sometimes, you know. But I'm the boots on the ground. You know, I, I know the situation really well. We're like staring at the wall really close. We have no idea what it is. I see it perfectly, Lord. He's like, back up. You don't even know what you're looking at. That's us, right? I'm the boots on the ground, Lord. He's like, you're the boots in the mud. You constantly making mistakes. We are. We think we got it all figured out, right? Abraham and Sarah had this great idea. This uh, Egyptian handmaid named Hagar, probably in her teens, early 20s. Oops. Not so good for his descendants, huh? Why? Because God's promises, church, they aren't a to-do list of stuff that we need to somehow help him accomplish. Newsflash, church, God doesn't need our help doing God things, right? Or doing anything else for that matter. So we see they didn't pray. Instead, they just acted in an effort to accomplish what God had already said he would accomplish regardless of their own efforts. Not great. That's what we see in verses 15 through 23. And then look at verses 23 through 26, where it says, And they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And when they prayed, they said, O Lord, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So this is good, right? They're finally praying. Cool. All right. All right. We're pretty far into this already. They've already made up their minds, but they finally start to pray. All right. All right. And they're like, Lord, do whatever you want. Oh, no, wait. Sorry. They're like, Lord, here's your options. Uh, Lord, we're... We're being gracious here. We're going to let you choose, Lord, between these two things that we've already decided. Think how funny this is, right? Allowing God to choose between two choices. Church, are we in a place to allow God to do anything? Does God need our permission or our guidelines? All right, Lord, here's what you're allowed to do in this situation. What? That doesn't make sense. But that's essentially what we're all doing when we say, Lord, do you want me to do this or do you want me to do that? And the irony, as we talked about earlier, of course, being that the word Lord means master and that would make us the slave, which is the term the Bible uses to describe Christians more than any other word in the New Testament, aside from maybe the term brethren. But Christian, believer, you know, these kinds of things, nope. You can combine all those together and double it. Still uses the word slave more often. You're not in charge. We're his servants. If we truly believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, then we believe in his life, death, and resurrection, and that we, through that, can be saved from our sins through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If we truly believe that, that he died on the cross and rose again, and the gospel, if we believe that, then we're his slaves. That's why we call him our Lord and Savior, because it's us laying down our lives to live for him. Jesus, when he's talking about the people that claim to be his followers, he'll say, Lord, Lord, he says in Matthew chapter seven, Lord, they'll come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, did I not do this? Did I not do that? Pointing to their works. And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. He doesn't say, oh, you didn't say the magic prayer, or you weren't confirmed, or you weren't baptized, or whatever. He doesn't say any of that, doesn't point to any of that. He says, I didn't have a relationship with you, so you're not making it into heaven. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, knowing God and the one whom he sent. Church, who did God send? Okay, and Jesus just said a minute ago that the people that go to hell are the ones that he doesn't know. 
So is it about doing little rituals or doing these kinds of things? Or is it about knowing Jesus, knowing God? So I don't ever want to deceive anyone. If they don't have a relationship with God, if they don't have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, they're not going to heaven according to what the Bible says. Very uncomfortable thing to tell people who have put their hope in all these other institutions and beliefs and all these traditions and these kinds of things. That's not what the Bible says. If you read the instruction manual, it says, here's how you do it. So many people are trusting in other things. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. And if he's Lord, then we're slave. We shouldn't be giving him options. They were acting like they were the Lord instead of the servant. And we see that all the time. But we do the same thing, don't we? Sometimes we say, Lord, here's the options. Rubber stamp one of these things that I'm allowing you to choose from. Lord, should I do A or B? John chapter 9, they come to Jesus. There's a guy there that was born blind. They say to him, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his father, that, uh, his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, no. They're like, A or B? Jesus says, no. But that the glory of God might be revealed. We can't give God options and then act like he's on the throne of our lives. It's a contradictory statement. It just can't be done. Church, whose plans do you think are better for your life? Yours or God's? You know, I always tell the story, Chuck Smith, who's my pastor, I grew up in the Calvary Chapel movement and everything. Chuck Smith, he used to tell the story of this girl that he had the hots for in high school. And he's praying, he's like, Lord... That would be swell if you made her. That's how they talked back then, swell. That would be swell if you made her my wife, Lord. Right? And God didn't. And he went to his 50th anniversary or 50th high school reunion. And then the prayer was, thank you, Lord, for not letting her be my wife. (laughs) You know, we laugh. It's funny, right? Because God sees how that's going to all play out. And he dodged a bullet. Whose plans are better? Yours or God's? I prayed for the Lord to bring me a wife that loved him more than me, and he brought me this atheist French girl with face piercings. I was just like, Lord, she's the godliest woman I've ever met now. She's on fire for the Lord and serves the Lord. I'll edit this part out. I want her head to puff up. No, she knows. She knows I think this. She thinks I'm crazy. Whereas everyone else thinks she's crazy. So I tell her, I know God loves me more than you because he gave me you, but you me. So I won that one. Married up. (laughs) She gets very offended when I say these things. Um, I introduced her to my friends back when we we were young. You know, we've been married forever. So. I introduced her to my buddies. My buddy said, yeah, man, she's, she's great, but what's wrong with her eyes? I said, what do you mean? Her eyes are fine. He said, well, there must be something wrong with her eyes if she's with you. I was like, I walked into that one, didn't I? <laughs> all right, all right. But God knows the downstream, right? God knows how it's all going to pan out. There is one other place we see Matthias mentioned in the Bible. The concordance. How often do we see Paul mentioned in the New Testament? Uh, Take out the Gospels, and he wrote about half of it. Crazy, right? Paul the Apostle, amazing. This is it for Matthias, though. This is curtains for him. And I'm sure he was a great man. Like I said, I'm probably not, you know, one one one-hundredth of the man that he was and is. You know, I'm sure we'll see him in heaven and I'll have to apologize. And I sincerely mean that. You know, I'm sure he was an amazing, godly man, right? For sure. But he wasn't the one, as far as I can tell from the pages of Scripture, he wasn't the one whom God had chosen to take Judas' place. Paul the Apostle was. Chosen by Jesus himself. Just like Jesus said, he chose all the other apostles. 
In verses 23 through 26, we again and again and again see the words they, 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 there. It's all the disciples, right? Them doing this, them doing that, them doing the other. Taking initiative, making plans, making moves, getting things done. Now flip over your Bible about six pages to the right to Acts chapter 13. Let's see what we have here in Acts chapter 13, guys. Take a look at verses 2 and 3 of Acts chapter 13. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Compare what happened there, which seems a whole lot easier, right? This took two verses to describe. Compared what happened there to what we just read this huge convoluted mess that we just read in Acts chapter one before the giving of the Holy Spirit where they're like, we can figure this out in the flesh. You see it, right? They ministered to the Lord. They fasted. The Holy Spirit said, separate to me. They fasted. They prayed. Church, which one of those do you want to describe your life looking back from eternity? The Acts chapter 1 experience, where you're spinning your wheels and trying to make sure God needs your help getting it done and you screw everything up and do your own thing? Or do you want the Acts 13 experience, where you're ministering to the Lord and you're waiting on the Lord and praying and fasting and seeking his face and he's guiding you and directing you and showing you what to do and because of that, just, you know, Paul's ministry, I, I think we could be conservative and say a few billion people got saved from Paul's ministry, right? as the apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah, that's you. That's me. Crazy, right? Incredible. Which one do you want your legacy to be when looking back from eternity? Do you want to do what makes sense? What sounds spiritual? And try to help God by trying to fulfill what he's already said that he's going to do? And asking him to rubber stamp your decisions and maybe if you're lucky, allow him to pick between two choices, right? And you end up stuck with a Matthias story. Or would you rather minister to the Lord and wait on the Lord and fast and pray and seek his face and end up with your life being a Paul the Apostle story? Which story do you want for your life? And on this one, guys, the ball is 100% in your court. How you conduct yourself when making decisions will 100% determine whether your life is a Paul the Apostle story or whether the only time you're mentioned again is in the concordance. You want God's best or your best? Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word, Lord. Your word is truth. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us through the power of your spirit, Lord, to make the decisions in the spirit rather than in the flesh. To wait on you, to minister to you, to fast and pray and seek your face and to do what you show us to do rather than trying to make it happen. Doing whatever makes sense. Doing whatever we already want to do and trying to make it sound spiritual. So, Lord, we pray that you would break us down in these areas and rebuild us in your spirit, in your word, and that we would make the decisions in our lives in the way that you tell us to, through prayer, through seeking your face, through waiting on you and praying and fasting. And, Lord, I pray that all of those here who know you, Lord, would commit to live their lives in a way that's different from the world, which does whatever makes sense. Lord, that we would lay these things before you and allow you to guide and direct our paths. And Lord, I pray that those who do not know you, Lord, would come to know you. So that when they stand before you, Lord, they hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Instead of, depart from me, I never knew you. And Lord, we pray that you would bless the baptism that we're going to do, Lord, and that you would bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. 